Chapter 18. The Signal A slap jerked Rass back into consciousness. Flames crackled all around him as he lay on the deck of a sinking airship. His ringing ears permitted him to hear what sounded like dull roars and screams. He opened his eyes to see Dixie straddling him, shaking his shoulders. He couldn't make out what she said, but it seemed urgent. Another explosion went off behind her as Rass foggily began to extricate himself from her grip. The elder ships were specks on the horizon, and Rass's understanding returned to him, if not his hearing. Dixie lashed onto his left arm and patted the grapple gun. She pointed up, yammering a million miles an hour. Rass struggled to sit up, and his eyes followed where she pointed. The brass fox hung, untouched. The balloon above them leaked air and the ship rocked again as another barrel of fuel supply exploded, dislodging the back half of the collective vessel and sending it plummeting. The front half shook and Rass scrambled to his feet. You want off this boat? Rass asked. Nothing she could say would convince him to save her, but it worked to her advantage that he couldn't understand her. All he could see was a scared girl without any other options. Would you save the rest of the collective too? He wondered. He had to decide soon. The ship continued to drift further away from the brass fox. Idiot. He chastised himself and stepped around a burning portion of the deck to get a clear line of sight on the brass fox. He aimed the grapple gun and looked back at Dixie. This is the part where you hold on. She rushed up and wrapped her arms tightly around his neck as he fired the device, connecting to the side of his ship. Rass and Dixie swung forward from the railing of the collective ship as it drifted to a fiery demise in the wasteland. Rass began retracting the cable, pulling both of them toward the ship while he tried to keep an eye on the vanishing elder vessels. For the next three minutes he stared, determined to log their heading as soon as he reached the bridge. The sound of the whipping wind indicated that his hearing was slowly returning. Once over the railing of the brass fox, Rass ducked out from underneath Dixie's arms and ran up to the bridge to estimate the compass's bearing of the now vanished ships. 121. He then spun on his heel and strode straight past Dixie, picking up her black duffel bag and immediately tossing it overboard. Hey! Rass could mostly make out what she said if he watched her mouth, and having a good idea of how one might react to losing all of one's possessions helped. I don't think you're in a position to complain, Rass said. He reached under the dash, collecting Dr. O's engine disruptor. I don't want any more surprises out of you. The only picture of my parents was in that bag. Rass looked over to the side of the ship for effect. It still is in the bag. You're welcome to go get it. He walked down to the deck and looked back. Just because I didn't let you die back there doesn't mean I'm taking passengers, he said before climbing down into the hold. Walking up to the jet cycle, he disabled its engine, assuming the idea of Dixie stealing the ride had already crossed both their minds. The purr of the Helios engine turned to a roar as the ship accelerated and descended. Dixie! Once above deck, he looked around for any other ships she might be trying to evade. There weren't any. The bag's that important, huh? Ras asked, walking up to the bridge. She didn't respond. Dixie, I'm sorry your city sank. I'm sorry you lost your parents, and I can't even imagine what you went through afterwards. You're right. You can't. Have I done anything to hurt you? He asked, stepping closer. She shook her head. How about Callie? No. Another step. Even if Verdon has sunk, which means I'm responsible for the death of my mother... I still have a chance to save someone I love, and I'd like to think that if you had that opportunity, you'd do whatever it took to save them. Dixie landed the brass fox. Two halves of the collective ship burned bright in the distance. She left you something by her typewriter, Dixie said, lowering the gangplank. Rass stared at her and then walked down to the captain's quarters. Inside the cannonball wrecked room, light shone in at odd angles. On the floor next to the lone table lie Callie's ruined typewriter. He gently lifted it, revealing a small wooden box wrapped in scraps of an old map. Atop it read, for Erasmus, in Callie's handwriting. Rass gingerly found the corners and unwrapped the box without tearing the paper. Lifting the lid revealed at first what looked like a jumble of replacement typewriter keys. He looked over her typewriter and noticed about a dozen keys pried off their stalks. He picked up one key and the rest lifted with it. Callista Torbion had left Rass a message. The bracelet read, Don't give up. He wouldn't. Not in a million years or a million miles. He would rescue Callista Torbion, and he pitied the man or machine that found him or itself between him and his mission. Strapping the bracelet on, he strode back to the helm. Dixie was nowhere to be found. Dixie? I'm down here, she replied from outside the ship. Rass looked over the edge to see her sitting on the ground next to her bag. Smart move, disabling the jet cycle, she said. I take it you found the message? Holding up his right wrist, the bracelet jangled. How'd you know about this? Girls talk, said Dixie. You two idiots were made for each other. Are you just going to wait here? Another wave is coming. They'll look for survivors by the distress beacon. She paused. Rass? Yeah. I was lying about Verdant. I just needed you to stop. Rass exclaimed with joy. Oh, you lying little... <laughs> then he grew sober. What are you going to tell the next wave? Stick around much longer and you'll find out, she said. Go find your girl. Dixie, you probably doomed us all, but thank you. If I had a dime, 
Rast ran back to the controls, aimed the ship at 121 degrees, and took off into the vastness of the wild. He half expected to catch up with the elders, imagining Callie overloading without him nearby, especially with time flowing so heavily in the air. But he reasoned that either whatever they sprayed her with nullified the effect, or she couldn't overload while unconscious. In the distance, a spherical cloud with a purple glow at its core hung in an otherwise cloudless sky. It reminded Rass of a purple convergence. Callie? Rass asked, wondered if she had overloaded trapping her captors. Freeing her from an eldership would put them in the midst of a group of hulking clockwork monsters as soon as he unfroze her, but he reasoned he could tether at least a few of the elders to their ship with magnets and cables. A slow groan interrupted his train of thought. It growled from his comm unit, unnerving him. Is this how elders communicate? He smacked the unit to see if it was simply malfunctioning. The machine stopped for a moment, then began looping a groan at an increased speed until it began sounding more and more like a voice. Mayday, it groaned, then looped again at a faster rate. Rass unplugged the comm unit to reset it, then plugged it back in to hear more of the message so it could speed up and loop again. Pilots never just shouted Mayday by itself. The groaning continued over the comm as Rass sailed closer to the sphere of growing cloud. Something had been caught at the center, and it sent out a distress call. Rass checked his coordinates against his memory of the ones Hal had given him. He was close to the collection spot for the verdant saving air, but he had a promise to keep to Callie. Regardless, he decided to start the collection process just in case. He approached the cloud at a good clip, searching for a possible break to see if it was the eldership that had taken Callie. At another smack, the comm unit started looping the next part of the message that was slowly working its way out of its time prison. Loop after loop, the message continued to clarify in a low register. Mayday. This is... Faster it ran until a man's regular speaking tone escaped. A tone Rass remembered. A tone Rass knew. Dad? The brass fox lurched to a complete stop after colliding with the invisible bubble, which had a larger radius than Rass guessed. Not that launching through the air at the brass fox's former speed afforded much time for rational thought. He smashed through the top of the steering wheel, sailing forward and leaving a trail of wooden shards freezing behind him as they lost proximity with Alak, who now flailed wildly past the front railing of a ship. Falling into the purple sphere left a wispy trail of cloud behind Rass as he shot inside. In the murky fog, he rocketed toward the obfuscated source of the purple glow. A frozen wind merchant vessel hanging in the midst of a 45-degree descent halted explosions billowing out from its underbelly. Rass careened into the back of the mercifully forgiving balloon, but bounced downward and landed hard on the bridge of the forward slanting ship. He struck the railing, vaulting him head over heels and flipping down onto the deck. Cracking pain filled his head as he continued to slide down the angled deck before spinning around and instinctively squeezing the trigger of his grapple gun to hit something, anything. As soon as the magnet shot forward and left his personal space, it froze, leaving a tangle of cables suspended in front of him. Gravity dictated his descent continue, but the spooling cable now anchored him to the sky. The front railing stopped its descent with a hearty crack, completing the wind merchant's haphazard transfer from one ship to another. Rass afforded himself a moment to take in his surroundings. He couldn't even begin to process the mechanics of the fall. Beyond the suspended cabling, he spotted a man on the bridge with glowing purple eyes, his mouth contorted into a scream. He held his stomach for reasons Rass couldn't discern due to distance, but this was his world, his bubble. Eliasphere was nowhere to be found. Rass felt stupid for letting himself get his hopes up. He wondered if he had misheard the voice or just wished so badly to be wrong about the boneyard that he had reopened the wound in order to properly mourn. He stood, pain shooting through his battered body. Amidst the debris piled against the front railing, a small comm transmitter with a ripped out wire lay at his feet. What are you doing so far from the bridge? He bent down to inspect it. Can't exactly hail a mayday without this. Leaning over the railing, Rass peered down into the foggy cloud. A man in stunted freefall hung not twenty feet below the doomed ship. His features were difficult to make out in the haze, but Rass knew whom he saw. Dad! Rass shouted. He felt stupid for the tears shed in the boneyard, yet relief washed over him in the knowledge that he wasn't alone in the wild. With heart racing, he almost called out again, but knew deep down that his father couldn't hear him. But, with any luck, the next thing Elias would know, he'd be on the brass fox. The details of how Rass would make it back on board his ship felt trivial at the moment. The cable anchored in time supported his weight, but he had difficulty trusting the concept. With a smile he couldn't lose if he tried, Rass spooled out cable and lowered himself over the edge of the ship. As he neared his father, Rass realized he was looking at a slightly older doppelganger of himself, with shorter hair and the same build. His father hadn't aged in ten years. Elias's back was on the ground and his face held a sadness Rass had never glimpsed as a child. The look of fear mixed with a lack of acceptance of the terms of his fate made Rass realize even his father was human after all. After a moment more of lowering, the two men were level with each other. Rass inspected the long-lost man. Elias sported the short beard that Emma had always ordered him to shave after returning from trips. 
Although only in his mid-thirties, Elias's face was tanned and well-worn from his time out in the wind. Wrinkles lined the creases around his eyes and mouth, reminding Ras of his father's ease with a smile. Ras wrapped his arm around his father's waist. Elias Veer snapped into a world foreign to him. The airship that had catapulted him to his death not moments ago now hung motionless, no longer careening forward in a blaze. His extremities fell back as some new harness wrapped around his midsection. Pain shot through his back as he recoiled and the sound of straining cable filled his ears. Pulling his head up, he could see a grapple gun cable running over the railing of his ship, then realized his so-called harness was actually another man. What's going on? Elias asked carefully. He turned his gaze from the man holding him to the ground far beneath him. Grasping tightly onto the belt of his unnamed savior, he positioned himself across the man's back. You're okay. We're okay, the man said. Just stay close. He pressed a button on his grapple gun, and the two of them ascended until they climbed over the edge of the ship's railing and back onto the deck. Elias rested himself free of the man's shoulder and took a step backward, still in shock over the fall. Suddenly, the man in front of him reappeared, once more hoisting Elias over his shoulder. Elias once again freed himself, only to instantly find himself returned to the same position. How are you doing that? Elias asked to the back of the man's head. You're trapped in a time bubble thing? I'm not. It's a long story. Who are you? Elias asked. That's a shorter story, but one I should probably tell back on my ship, he said. You can stand if you stay close, I think. Oh. Elias said as he let himself down from the man's back, keeping his hand on the man's shoulder. Pain pulsed in his leg as he noted the bit of wood paneling still lodged in his thigh. He gritted his teeth, pulled it out, and tossed it to the side. You know, I'm still not entirely over the fact that I'm not falling. Who's your friend? The man asked, indicating the time knack. Oh, poor soul. That's Morris. Elias stepped forward and instantly the man popped in front of Elias's direct field of view. The two stood face to face for the first time. Remember, I need you to stick close, the man said before spinning on his heel to hide his face. There was something familiar about him. Sorry about that, Elias said. Morris, he said. Where's he from? The man asked, avoiding the line of discussion. He led Elias up the stairs to the bridge. Here, Elias said. He's a Lorian. He's... was my guide. The man turned to look at Elias. Wait, I thought there weren't any people here. It's called a Loria? The man outside the bubble is surprised by what happens here? Interesting, Elias said, arcing an eyebrow. Hold on. I know who you remind me of. My wife. Around the eyes, mostly. He let out a deep breath. Sorry, that was going to drive me crazy. Huh, the man said, leading Elias to the edge of the bridge. See that dark spot in the clouds? I'm going to need you to stand here and fire the shot. The man unstrapped the grapple gun from himself and handed it to Elias. It'll freeze as soon as it gets away from me, but once I unfreeze Morse, where? Elias inspected the grapple gun. His grapple gun. I'll explain as soon as we're back on my ship, the man said, still offering the device. What's your name? Elias asked, accepting it. On the ship, please, the man said. Now, after you shoot, I'll unfreeze Morris, which will take the ship back into a free fall and my ship back into full speed. I need you to account for those factors. Yeah, got it, Elias said. What happens to Morris? He'll fall a bit and then probably overload again, freezing the ship without us on it, the man said. Who is he? The grandson of someone very important, Elias said. I can't leave him. We're gonna have to, the man said. But hey, he survived ten years like this, so who's to say ten years? Elias exclaimed, his mind spun. Are you saying I've been frozen for ten years? The man sighed. I just need you to make the shot. Elias took a moment to process. He looked at the man's jacket, grapple gun, and face. His eyes narrowed. No. A long pause. Rass? Yeah, Dad. Elias threw his arms around his son, catching Rass off guard. Oh, my boy, you... you got big. He heaved a huge sigh, thankful that his son evidently hadn't read his letter of warning not to take to the skies. But ten years. Gone. What about Emma? His mind flooded with questions. Rass enthusiastically wrapped his arms around his father, reaching all the way around for the first time. I found your ship. I thought... Hijacked. Sky Pirates. Elias said. Morris and I had to find this tub to continue. He released his son, holding him at arm's length to take a good look at his boy. Where did you find it? Outside Solaria. Elias laughed. They flew it into the boneyard. You know about that place? I guess it's not bedtime story material, Elias said. How in Atmo did you find me? Hal gave me coordinates, but he didn't tell me you were going to be here, Rass said dismissively. Look, Dad, I hate to rush this, but we really need to get back on my ship. One more question, just in case we don't make it. Elias said, finishing strapping on his grapple gun. How's your mother? Still waiting for you to come home, but if we don't hurry, there's not going to be a home to get back to. 
Fair enough, Elias said, beaming at his grown son. He took aim, adjusted up and slightly to the front of the ship. That's probably enough lead. He squeezed the palm trigger. Rast stepped back, stopping his father once more. The fact that Elias so casually accepted the idea of Verdon not being around when they made it home gave him pause. He walked over to Morris. Hopefully this will be just another moment and then someone will be here to help you, said Rast before placing his hand on the wounded man's shoulder. The ship lurched, sending Rast off his feet and flying upward as the ship continued its doomed course. Panic shot through Rast. While he had acclimated to falling, he missed the grapple gun. A hand clasped tightly around Rast's forearm. I gotcha. Elias pulled him in close as the cable continued to spool out. Do we miss the... Rass's body jerked under Elias's grasp, and the two veers soared away, trailing behind the brass fox. The doomed vessel disappeared below the cloud bubble before freezing again in a new position. The view in front of them caused Rass's heart to sink. In the distance, cliffs loom, ready to smash the brass fox if it didn't gain altitude soon. The two men neared the underbelly of the ship and were sucked into the collection tube, banging around until they landed inside the glass tank in the ship's hold. You were pulling a collection? Elias asked over the loud vacuum. Rass released his death grip on his father. Hal told me he needed air from these coordinates. Elias chuckled. I'm glad the message tube made it to him. How do we get out of here? He didn't know how long they'd have before they struck the cliffs, and every second could be the one that killed them both. Gonna have to break the glass. Shame. He reared back to strike the glass with a grapple gun. You can't! Why not? Because Hal needs air from here from his ship, and if I can't collect it, then I've sunk verdant. How could you possibly have sunk Verdant, Elias asked. Because I destroyed the last convergence, and if I bring Hal air, he'll pay to replace Verdant's engines with Helios ones and pay for fuel, and he rambled on as fast as he possibly could. Rass, Rass, it's okay, Elias said. How? Trust me. Elias swung his left arm back into the glass, shattering the containment tank around them. Glass showered down while Rass scrambled across the hold and ascended the ladder up to the deck. Above, he saw the cliffs growing closer, too close for him to make it to the bridge on time, too close for him to save Callie or Verdant. He had rescued his father just in time to ram them both into a cliff. The slim likelihood of success didn't stop him from trying. He dashed toward the stairs up to the bridge. As he ascended, the ship shifted, causing his footing to slip. Gravity slung him back down the stairs. The ship turned hard to port, and while it still neared the cliffs, it now did so at an angle, striking them with a glancing blow, which earned it yet another battle scar and sent it back out into the open skies. Rass picked himself back up and shouted down to his father. What did you do? Elias poked his head up from the hold. More than one place on a ship you can steer. We lose anything important? Rass dumbly shook his head. I don't think so, just another step towards winning Atmos' ugliest wind merchant vessel, which I guess isn't technically even a collection ship anymore. He stared off to the horizon, lost in thought. Never insult your girl, Rass, Elias said. What's her name? The Brass Fox or Callie? Elias lifted an eyebrow. The neighbor girl? You two together? No, and that's my problem, Rass said. Well, one of many. Elias nodded thoughtfully and walked up to the bridge. Dad, how am I supposed to save Verdant now? You never were, so don't worry about it, Elias said, studying the controls. I like the layout. You build this? Yeah. Wait, you mean Hal wasn't going to replace the engines? Maybe. Maybe not, Elias said, then slapped his son on the arm and gave him a winning smile. So, Callie Torbion. I always figured you had a thing for her. Elias monitored the control panel, then took the wheel to strike out on a new heading. Dad, where are you going? I have to save Callie. And the rest of Verdant, I get that. No, the elders have her. We came to the wild, I mean Loria, together, and I was just on my way to get her back when I ran into you. A screech resounded far and wide across the barren plains of Eloria. What's that? Rass asked. Elias's eyes widened. The main gate. Someone did my job.